This episode of Primitive Culture is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international programme of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. Open your mind to the past. All this may mean something. I've been coerced into watching tonight's movie. You do have books in the 24th century. It's the primitive culture. I'm just trying to blend in. Some people think the future means the end of history. We haven't run out of history quite yet. Hello and welcome to Primitive Culture, a Trek FM podcast all about our history, our culture and how Star Trek relates to it. I'm Duncan Barrett and today I'm joined by Dr. Ethan Siegel, the author of a fantastic book called Treknology. Hi Ethan, how are you? Hi Duncan, it's my pleasure to be here and thank you for having me on your Trek FM show. It's absolutely my pleasure. I, uh, I, I've mentioned your book, I think, once on a show uh, a few months ago. I picked it up a few months back and was absolutely uh, kind of entranced by it because I'm sort of fascinated. I mean, on this podcast, basically, we look at really the connections between Star Trek and the real world. But my background is I'm a historian, so I'm generally looking for kind of historical parallels and historical influences uh, and so on that have kind of fed into Star Trek's writers. But I am kind of fascinated by this idea of how Star Trek has also fed back into the real world. And I think this concept of technology, you know, as, as you term it, is really the the way to find that. And some of these, um, you know, I learned an awful lot uh, from your book, a few things that I was kind of familiar with before, but a lot of things I uh, really hadn't realised at all that Star Trek has kind of um, extended its tentacles into the real world one way or another. You know, for me, this was a fascinating book to research and write because I have a feeling I learned more learning about these uh, technologies and what actually the last, you know, three to five decades, if you go back to either the start of Next Generation or start of the original series, how many of these, you know, futuristic envisioned technologies have actually come to fruition, or in many cases, how our real world technology in 30 to 50 years has surpassed what we envisioned the future would be like two or 300 years into the future. It's amazing. I mean, funnily enough, I was uh, recently at the recent Star Trek convention in Birmingham. I was interviewing Rick Sternbach. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to him about was the design of the pad and the fact that, you know, when I grew up watching Next Gen in the 90s, that just seemed like such a kind of futuristic piece of technology. And now I'm, you know, literally recording this interview on my iPad. I mean, it's kind of, this is one of these things where sort of unexpectedly, sometimes technology kind of uh, catches up sooner than we were imagining it was going to somehow. It's really fascinating. You know, I think I think when the iPad came out, uh, Michael Okuda, who is the uh, you know designer who designed the uh, many of the set elements on Next Generation, including the uh, the PADDS, the pads, the uh, you know these futuristic devices, um, when the iPad first came out, he was one of the first to say, like, this is it. This is this is what I had in mind when I designed this, except, you know, he used, like, printed things that were laminated and made to look futuristic, but weren't actually operational. This is one of the things that I think drove a lot of what Steve Jobs did. There's an interview with him and Bill Gates from the 2000s, where they're talking about what the future of technology holds. And, you know, Gates was optimistic or pessimistic about very various technologies. And Steve Jobs just cut him off and said, just give me Star Trek. Just Star Trek is what I want. And when the iPad came out, that idea of a touchscreen interface that could, you know, give you any information that humanity had in a matter of seconds with more computing power than existed in all the worlds in like 1980 in one device, it was just phenomenal. It was just a phenomenal illustration of how far we've leapt forward from when, you know, these 
technologies from next gen were envisioned in the late 80s and early 90s that that 20 years later we had these technologies the way they were envisioned in the 2300s in the palm of our hands and i suppose there's an element there as well of the the fact that the technologies that kind of take us by surprise in some ways are i suppose they're the kind of more consumer oriented things so apple obviously you know hugely successful business model really you know getting people around the world to adopt these things to adopt you know for, for me to get an ipad for everyone to kind of well not everyone to get an ipad obviously but in schools and so on you know they kind of manage to have a sort of business model that gets those products out there so they do become a part of um people's lives you, you know another one for example actually that i couldn't have imagined growing up in the 90s and watching star trek was going to be real was the voice recognition you know i have an amazon echo i've got several of them now i've got them in most rooms of the house and it means that you know i can turn the lights on and off i can uh, i've just plugged in uh, we just uh, decorated this is going to date the recording of this podcast but we've just been decorating our christmas tree and i managed to get the christmas tree lights plugged into a, a little um a smart plug so that i can then put them on the system along with all the other lights and i can say lights up or lights down or turn the christmas tree on or off uh and you know it does it it is it is magic it is like living on the enterprise you know it is in a lot of ways you know i i don't know if you remember there was this next generation episode where uh reg barclay um you know gets uh he becomes like super super intelligent and he wants to build a brain computer interface so that he can just with his thoughts control the entire ship and uh, he walks into the holodeck and he tells the ship's computer to start building this device and the ship's computer, you know, stops and tells him that it doesn't know how to do that. And he says, then I'll tell you. And he just starts barking instructions to the ship's computer and the ship's computer understands what he's saying, creates uh, holographic versions of what he says. He goes and hooks himself up to it. And the next thing we see is this is true. And this brings just a tremendous tremendous number of futuristic technologies together. The idea that a computer could recognize your voice and write programming languages to execute your commands and then execute them and make real life matter versions of the things that you said you wanted it to build and then to go and uh and implement it and have it read your thoughts and have that be the orders that the computer is obeying. All of those elements individually represented just a tremendous visionary leap forward in technology. And here we are in the 21st century, just at the start of the 21st century, and so many of these technologies are not only here, but they're proceeding in ways that we really couldn't have envisioned in the late 80s, early, early 90s, where the, these this voice recognition software, yes, it it can listen to what you say, and it can interpret that and turn that into computer codes and a set of instructions that it will execute. Um, but in addition to that, it can also translate it into any languages that you want. So that universal translator that came along for the ride is also real now. And it can, um, it can, you know, allow you to control computerized interfaces with merely a thought. And these are augmented reality or human tech, human augmented technologies that, again, are right at our disposal today. I don't think that Barclay's specific device is something we can do, and we still struggle making uh, tangible holograms on the scale that that such a device would require. But what seemed like an unfathomably powerful idea just, you know, 20 to 30 years ago is now something that, you know, most of the elements in that technology are already here and a few others that aren't quite here yet seem closer than ever before. It's really remarkable how life is imitating art in exactly this fashion. You know, when you were talking about the idea of a mind reading computer, I did sort of um, have a little moment of thinking, oh, you know, I do sort of sometimes wish that my Amazon Echo could read my mind because I do quite often, uh, you know, pose a question and get a kind of blank. I don't know what you're asking me or I don't understand the question or whatever. And I suppose these are kind of technologies that will be ironed out and will improve gradually, you know, with updates and with software changes and so on uh, over time. But of course, there's another big issue with these um you know devices like that a lot of people are very concerned about privacy 
privacy. If you got a computer that was able to read people's minds, I think uh, people would start freaking out, wouldn't they? They'd be kind of... Um, these are some of the concerns that, in a way, Star Trek sidesteps some of the real world uh, concerns. And I suppose there's this interesting kind of question of like... Uh, in Star Trek, all the technology, generally speaking, it's all there. We don't very often see the, re the kind of introduction of new technologies within a series. I suppose you did get that in Deep Space Nine where they brought the hollow communicator in and then it lasted one episode and they got rid of it. Um, and obviously they now got this kind of continuity issue with Discovery and so on where they had to kind of use the holograms and then get rid of the holograms and, and, and all this kind of stuff. But I suppose there's these kind of interesting questions in the real world when these technologies come in. We don't live in this perfect utopian future. You, you know, there are kind of financial incentives. There are kind of business elements to it. There is kind of competition between different companies trying to do the same thing and, um, you know, almost working against each other. It's a sort of, um, the, the, the progress of technology in our world versus in the kind of fictional world of Star Trek, obviously, is different. And the kind of motivating factors are different, uh, behind some of those changes. I agree with that completely. I think that the motivating factors, you know, one of the, utopian aspects of Star Trek is how we were driven forward in, in the Star Trek universe, not by economic profit or human ambition or anything like that. We were driven forward by a, by a desire to better the entire species and by, and by extension, uh, every species, every intelligent species we encountered in the universe. Um, and that this was, this was a, a change in motivation in how from how we do business in the uh 20th and now the 21st centuries but the one of the things i really appreciate about star trek is that it was never meant to be divorced from these ethical issues that you bring up where uh privacy and uh also related security are definitely among them uh one of the I think most stellar examples of where Star Trek uh, actually brings this up with the implementation of a new technology is when uh, Jordy LaForge in uh, the Generations movie uh, has his visor hacked by the uh, Duras sisters, uh, Lursa and Bator, and what they're able to do by hacking his visor, which, you know, is in many ways a uh, – is a is an augmented reality technology because it allows him even though he's blind and doesn't have his optic nerves connected successfully uh, from his brain to his to the inputs his eyes get uh, he has this device a visor that you know creates a new neural pathway that allows him to see it's actually more powerful than your eyes because it takes input from across the electromagnetic spectrum and allows your brain to interpolate it and reconstruct what appears to be a visual image. Well, they hack into his visor and they can see what he sees. So they get the security codes to the shields on the Enterprise and they inflict heavy damage on it. And even though the Enterprise is able to overpower this Klingon bird of prey, they sustain enough damage that they have to crash down on the planet. And this idea of a security or a privacy flaw, uh, came back came up in Star Trek in a very real very consequence heavy fashion and I think that new technologies do bring that along when I think about some of the some of the great technologies that Star Trek have has brought to us it's not just the idea of a vision augment that's uh that comes with these security or privacy risks it's the idea of you know any sort of invasive thing into your life when you you know, I, I am sure there are things that go on in those Hollis suites that people don't want anything to know about. And if you look at even some of the relatively tame fantasies of someone like Riker or, or Barclay again, um, they, they are really, uh, I guess squeaky is the word I would choose. Like the, you don't leave feeling very good about yourself watching some of those moments, particularly, uh, if you rewatch them today. Um, but I think that, I think that when you talk about ethics and privacy and security, these are, 
these are real issues that Star Trek, I don't think, would be afraid to reckon with because it's not just about the development of these technologies and the new things it enables. It's also about the good ethical uses of these technologies for the right purposes that can often be corrupted and used for more nefarious ends. Like many people, I think, are justifiably worried about their privacy, their security. Um, it makes you wonder if, uh, if something like Yahoo or numerous banks can't even keep your password secure. <laughs> What is that going to mean for implanted devices where if someone hacks it, they could feed your eyes false visual signals, which could have real catastrophic consequences if you're driving on the highway, or they could feed your pacemaker false signals to simply stop your heart. These are real legitimate concerns, and I think anyone who works in the field of cybersecurity or online privacy or infosec, um, these are issues that are being dealt with and reckoned with that maybe still have lots of room for improvement. Uh, but also, I think, uh, I think many of those themes about our fears around privacy and security are echoed, uh, in many different aspects of a number of Star Trek series. Well, certainly, I suppose the more, I mean, as people begin integrating technologies more into their own bodies and so on, I can see that that will become definitely a, a greater concern. I mean, something like Geordie's situation, you, you know, to us maybe, and certainly back in the 90s when we were watching Generations, that seems uh, not outlandish, but, you know, it's it's definitely in the realm of science fiction. But, I mean, we did have a story not that long ago of a, a couple whose baby monitor, where they had a, you, you know, a Wi-Fi internet connected baby monitor, and they discovered, I think it was like in a teddy or something, you know, with a, with a kind of nanny cam in there. And they discovered some random guy on the internet was talking to their baby in the middle of the night, uh, you know, which understandably really freaked them out. And I don't know why, I don't know if he was just doing it to see if, if he could get it to work or whatever it was just a hacker or what the kind of motivation was but that idea of that kind of invasion of your personal space and, and that idea that you know your your amazon echo might be kind of listening in the whole time uh is sort of very alarming i mean on the other hand i suppose in star trek they have a weird attitude to these kind of issues anyway because you know everyone has a communicator on them anyone can be tracked at all times by their communicator just in the same way i suppose in some ways as you know i have my family on my family and friends or whatever it's called on your phone which does mean you can see you, you know you, you know when they're coming home or you know when they're around the corner or whatever i mean in some ways these technologies maybe we become quite blasé about them and we become i mean i'm not particularly anxious about amazon listening in on whatever of banal conversations my family are having over dinner. Some people I know, you know, literally won't have those technologies in their house uh, because of those kind of anxieties. But I guess in some ways, Star Trek always seems to be, there doesn't ever seem to be that much anxiety about these technologies, even as the plot of, of various stories, Geordie's visor being a good example, shows the dangers of them. We, do, we don't see all that much resistance. I mean, we see the transporter phobes, I suppose. But other than that, people in Star Trek, generally speaking, I suppose, there isn't a huge amount of concern about new technologies in those kind of ways. No, but there are concerns about how um, new technologies can be implemented in ways that will, I guess, trade your right to privacy for a perception of security. You know, I'm I'm thinking in particular of the uh, arc from Deep Space Nine, where uh, they are worried about a Dominion plant about a series of, uh, of, you know, uh, the, uh, the shapeshifters like Odo on, uh, on Earth. And they're worried about an attempted coup about the, uh, brought about by the changelings where a changeling has gone and, um, and replaced, uh, Admiral Layton. Um, and they, this was a two part story and Ben Sisko has to go back to Earth and he meets his dad back on Earth. And Ben Sisko's goal is to go ahead and take blood samples of everyone he encounters to see if they're really a human or if they're a changeling instead. And his dad starts patiently explaining to him that this is not what we do. This is not how we live. This is not how we use technology. We don't 
We don't force people to prove that they are who they are. We don't trade this level of privacy for this illusion of security. This is, this is not how we live. And Cisco, in what I think is a remarkable moment for Star Trek, uh, like this is something that I can't imagine happening on the original series or in Next Generation. Cisco just gets his Federation goons to hold his dad down and forcibly est- extracts the blood from him. And and um and you can see like Cisco's dad's face fall and you can see the anguish on Cisco's face as he betrays his own principles for nothing because his dad is a human he's just his dad with his dad's sense of ethics um and Cisco has gone and violated his principles and violated his dad's trust and gained nothing from it and one of the things I love about this and this is maybe speaking to a darker aspect of my personality is I love how they just have to live with it and move past it because there are still the threat and there's still the things that have to be reckoned with, but you've gone and traded your privacy for this illusion of security that hasn't actually accomplished or fixed anything. And that to me, that was a groundbreaking moment. That was a moment that stuck with me a lot. And this is years before 9-11, where we signed away many, many of our own privacy rights here in the United States for the illusion of security in on the international and national stages. So when they did that in Star Trek, that was something that that I know impacted me very hard and and made me realize, you know, these issues of privacy and security and technology, they are closely related and we cannot let our fears of what might be out there or of how these technologies can be used for nefarious purposes to We can't let them stop the development of the technology, but we should let our own ethical compasses be the guiding force in how these technologies are implemented. That that a lot of these things that you say you're not worried about, I know many people who are worried about them. For example, when I'm when I'm driving down the down the street, I'm very reliant on my maps applications to tell me where to go and what the fastest routes are and what traffic delays are. And I'm very thankful for all the other people who have their map software up there that's, you know, keeping track of their traffic and their routes and where they're going so that, you know, you can optimize how to get to your destination for everyone. But at the same time, I don't like the idea of Google or anyone continuing to track my location, even when that application isn't running. I don't really like the idea of there being an electronic record of where I am at all times or where anyone with any phone or GPS tracking device is at all times, uh, even if there are societal benefits, because, you know, I think that that having that level of privacy just taken away from you, you know, by default, I think that's a real issue that many, many people are not comfortable with giving up that aspect of their privacy. Sure. And I think that's absolutely fair enough. And I, I do completely understand that. I mean, it's interesting you you bring up Deep Space Nine with those uh, Homefront and Paradise Lost, those episodes, which I think you're right, were very much ahead of their time. They're episodes that in subsequent years, you sort of go back to and you think, wow, they really, you know, they, they hit that on the head in a way that maybe we didn't even notice um, somehow as much uh, at the time. And it kind of, I suppose, does tie in with this sense that Deep Space Nine of all the Star Trek series is maybe the most wary, is the most cynical about something like that, something that we might think of as trustworthy. Deep Space Nine's the show that's going to kind of say, well, you know, yeah, you think you trust them, but I mean, you know, look, Section 31 would be a kind of example of it. Deep Space Nine's the only show that would introduce uh, an element like that that kind of slightly undermines the entire uh, concept of Starfleet and the Federation that we've kind of um, come up against or come up with you know, that we've kind of had established so far. But I suppose you could say that Star Trek in some ways, as much as Star Trek uh, sort of puts forward this uh, technological utopia, I mean, a lot of the kind of 
um, utopian elements of Star Trek are reliant on technology. The fact they have replicators that can kind of produce food or whatever, the fact that they kind of, um, you, you know, can exp- we, we, we hear in first contact how warp drive kind of changed human society. At the same time, there's also, you could say, and this goes against slightly what I was saying earlier, there is a strand, I think, of sort of technophobia that runs through Star Trek. You know, right from the very beginning, back in the 1960s, you look at an episode like The Ultimate Computer. It's very much about this idea of technology being kind of opposed to the human somehow, about this fear that technology is going to kind of change us and change our lives and strip something away from us. And then even, you know, with kind of developing technology, something like um, genetic engineering, we get the story, it's the kind of Frankenstein story where, you, you know, we, we meddle with things and it all goes wrong. And there's this kind of sense of, you know, scientists pushing the boundaries in way that they ways that they shouldn't one way or another. So I suppose in some ways you could say Star Trek, because it's a very humanist show, is always slightly walking that tightrope of celebrating the technology of the future and in the real world, absolutely inspiring a more advanced, more comfortable uh, technological future. But always... Or, or at least intermittently with this kind of caveat of, you know, well, but, you know, just be careful you don't. I mean, almost people talk about now, you, you know, people walking down the street with their phones in their hands, kind of, you know, being sucked into their technology. Um, and, and we sort of had that with Next Gen with the episode The Game, where everyone got obsessed with that game, was kind of sucked into it. I feel like Star Trek's always has this slight anxiety around technology in a way um, or about the way that it, it might interact with people, that there could be something kind of uncomfortable there. I agree with that completely. I think that for me, when Star Trek is at its best, what it does is it translates our present anxieties about many aspects of society, including and maybe particularly about the frontiers of technology and what we have to gain or lose uh, as they as they become elements of our of our daily lives. Um, I get really interested to look at this and sort of see, you know. What is this anxiety that we're seeing played out on original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, Discovery, or in any of the movies? What are these anxieties about? And there are, to me, they're always about that fine line between how a new technology can enable a utopia or how it can enable a dystopia, depending on how it's implemented. And so when you talk about, you know, genetic engineering, I don't think there are very, very many people who will say, you know, hey, we have the ability to, uh, prevent your unborn child from being born with these, uh, you know, challenges that will certainly afflict them throughout their whole life. Or we could just flip this genetic switch and your child will be born, uh, you know, completely typical without these uh, difficulties that someone who has these mutations in them will endure. I think there are very few people who would argue against the ethics of that, but you go far enough down that and you start optimizing genetics for what you believe will get you the the most optimal outcome. And all of a sudden, you run into a civilization that loses its genetic diversity, or you run into a dystopia like they portrayed, I know this is not Star Trek, but in the movie Gattaca, or you can wind up, you know, weeding out genetic traits that are actually beneficial to society because you have a twisted view of eugenics, or you can wind up with the dystopia that they actually, you know, put forth in Star Trek that you spoke about, which is that you get Khan, and then, you know, 20, 25 years later, you get Wrath of Khan. And these are, these are iconic Star Trek moments that really do hit on this notion of what makes us human, what makes us truly civilized and advanced and and it puts right up against that the technology that we're developing that's burgeoning and how do we put it to good use while still being ethical um that to me is when star trek's really at at its best is when it wrestles with this and maybe even when it doesn't come up with a clear answer i think as we start to enter the era of artificial intelligence and Many people start hoping to produce, um, I guess, not only a machine that will pass a Turing test, but something that can be qualified as actually a new form of life. I think questions like, uh, like the ones raised in my favorite Next Generation episode, the measure of a man become more and more omnipresent of what 
makes a living being truly alive? Absolutely. And these certainly are, are questions that, you know, perhaps we will need to kind of wrestle with on a sort of philosophical level um, sooner or later. And, and maybe it's good that we've had Star Trek kind of laying the groundwork for 50 odd years, you, you know, kind of preparing us for some of these dilemmas and for some of these questions. And, and I'm sure that there must be, I, mean, I don't know if anyone's ever researched this, but there must be a kind of um, an influence of, you know, people who've grown up as, as I have, you know, watching Star Trek, watching episodes like The Measure of a Man. If those people do then go into a kind of artificial intelligence and so on, that must at some level play into their kind of attitudes to Towards these kind of issues, because I mean, even within Star Trek, there was there have been um, the, the, it's it's been a slightly grey area. I remember reading a pair of interviews um, with Jerry Taylor and Brandon Braga, both of whom were kind of showrunners on Voyager, talking about the character of the Doctor. And the interviewer asked both of them the same question: "Is the Doctor alive?" And Jerry Taylor said, "Of course he's alive. What a stupid question. What do you mean?" And Brandon Braga said, "Don't be ridiculous. He's not alive." Um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So even within that kind of within one show and at one pretty much at one time. You had these two people who had diametrically uh, opposed positions, but at least Star Trek kind of raises these questions uh, and raises these kind of, um, I suppose, raises these moral questions around the use of technology and around the development of technology and reminds us to keep asking and to keep questioning. Even um, that episode about the exocomps, you know, where data is kind of protecting the rights of these little robots, which are not that much, but they're a bit more sophisticated than a robot vacuum cleaner. But, you, you know, they're kind of, we are sort of used to robots doing these kind of menial tasks now in our in our homes. Um, and it does sort of raise these questions like, how do you treat them? How do you, you know, and how do you, how do you treat the Amazon Echo? Do you shout at it? Do you get angry with it? Or do you feel, I mean, I sort of, I've got a four year old son. I, I think I would anyway, but I certainly feel it's important to set an example to him that we are quite polite towards the Echo, even when it is slightly infuriating and it gets things wrong the whole time that you kind of don't lose your rag with it. You know, you kind of treat it with respect somehow. That, that feels important to me somehow, uh, partly because it sort of has a human voice and everything, I suppose, but I guess there is an interesting question there about our our interaction with technologies and our interaction with machines and how we uh, govern those relationships and those interactions. I agree completely. And I think uh, the data with the exocomps episode is a really interesting one. I think the episode where they have the nanites in Star Trek is a really interesting one for that. Um, because what do you do when a machine demonstrates that it goes beyond its initial programming? And what do you do when a machine, um, you know, starts to display traits that you associate not only with only living beings, but only with intelligent beings. Um, I like the question you ask of how do you model the behavior of how you treat the echo, even when the echo is infuriating, uh, to your four year old son, because you are modeling behavior that's going to inform how your son grows up in the world and how he interacts not only with other people, but with, with technology. Um, do you treat it with respect? Do you treat it with courtesy? And why do we, why do we do things the way we do? You know, if I were to go back to measure of a man, I can remember like Riker gives the, uh, Riker gives testimony arguing that data is not a living being, and it's very compelling and straightforward and easy to follow. And Captain Picard's rebuttal is actually not focused on removing or erasing Commander Riker's point, but instead arguing that here are the three criteria that we need to say – are met for something to be considered alive. And it meets criteria one and it meets criteria two. And here's criteria three. And does data meet criteria three? And the answer is he doesn't know. No one knows. So what do we do in the absence of knowledge? In the absence of certainty, which side do we err on? Do we err on the side of saying, well, I don't think it's alive, so it's not alive, so let's kill it and its property, and there's that? Or do we err on the side of maybe this is alive, and if I cannot beyond a doubt demonstrate that it's not a living being, then maybe I have to give it the rights of a living being. And that to me was a very interesting framing of the problem because it sort of sidesteps the issue of let's answer this unanswerable question and instead tells us in the face of uncertainty surrounding this question, 
what should we do as far as our actions go? And that to me was, uh, you know, I think I was maybe, you know, 14 or 15 when I saw that episode. That was a revelation of a, a new way to think about a difficult problem that I hadn't considered up until that point in my life. And I think it's kind of characteristic of Star Trek in a way that Star Trek will always err on the side of that sort of compassionate, generous, uh, y- you know, in some ways it's safer. You could say it's safer morally to kind of err on the side of caution in a situation like that rather than risk exploiting something that might be alive. Uh, better to run the risk of, you know, sort of foolishly imagining that something that something is when it isn't, if you know what I mean. Star Trek may be kind of takes that sort of position. Um, the, the other thing that strikes me talking about all these technologies that are kind of developed that Star Trek's predicted one way or another or even inspired. I mean, one thing that I think Star Trek never, certainly 90s Star Trek really never quite got about our real world future development, of course, is the development of the internet. I mean, there are kind of references in the past tense episodes, for example, there's a, there is a kind of proto internet that is it, you know, it seems quite basic, but that it exists that they show on screen. But I think the the way that the internet has kind of transformed our lives, the way that it's made information so accessible, uh, the, the rise of kind of social media and the kind of idea of like targeted information, all these kind of things. I mean, and these have good as well as uh, bad, as well as good properties. I mean, we're in the midst of an election campaign here in the UK. Uh, pretty much every political campaign for the last, you know, three or four years or whatever has been massively influenced by these kind of targeted ads. There's been this whole debate about, you know, Twitter saying they won't run political ads because of the way that it's played out. Facebook under enormous pressure and so far um, ignoring that pressure pretty much to to do anything along the same lines as well. I mean, there are all these kind of um, aspects of not just information, but kind of disinformation that come along with that technological development that I don't think, in some ways, I'm not sure that Star Trek really predicted the the confusion that technology can can uh wreak in the world because technology in star trek all seems to make things simpler i sort of feel like i i long for the the days a few years ago where you could easily tell what was true and what wasn't and it's getting to the point where i mean deep fake technology for example people are very concerned about this deep fake technology that is almost impossible to uh detect potentially i mean it's getting to that point um of course, in Deep Space Nine, we had the kind of deep fake of, you know, Quark working on that sort of pornographic hollow program where the guy wanted to imagine he was with Major Kira or whatever. But, you, you know, we can do these, um, we can pretty much do these things and present something that looks genuine, that looks believable, and people will buy it to the extent that, um, you know, with the political advertising yesterday, I think a report came out saying that one of the major political parties here in the UK, 88% of their online ads were factually incorrect one way or another. And yet that is what those people get to read. And the, and the way that, um, technology has not democratized and kind of, um, it, it hasn't pushed everyone closer to the truth somehow. It's actually just made people more accessible to different agendas and different kind of stories. Yeah, I think this is, this is an issue that when Star Trek brings up issues of deception like that, uh, it normally comes up with either aliens are, are that or, or imposters, um, where you have, for example, um, you have, for example, the episode in Next Generation where one of the uh, Lycian soldiers comes on board the Enterprise and everyone's memory is damaged and they've made this false sort of narrative where he's the first officer and he tries to get Captain Picard removed so that the Lycians, uh, you know, a species that's maybe about a hundred years behind the Federation in technology and their rival species is also about a hundred years behind, uh, can grab one of the Enterprise's weapon and win the war with a single photon torpedo strike. Um, that's how I think that typically comes up in Star Trek. You know, you have the you have the changelings from Deep Space Nine that can impersonate someone, but that's that's their alienness. You have uh you have Lorca from the mirror universe who comes in in Discovery and poses as Prime Universe Lorca uh for his own ends in the mirror universe. And that's um you know, 
when you think about these things, you see like, okay, it's not really technology that's driving this. It's that there is, there is the need for a deception and the technology can help enable it, but the technology itself is not to blame. We even see that in the episode where, uh, where Wesley Crusher gets busted for trying to cover up a piloting stunt that he and a few of his friends at Starfleet Academy performed that resulted in the deaths of one of their fellow students. Um, that's really, I think, where Star Trek might bring up these issues that we think about today tangentially, but isn't really bringing up how technology makes these, you know, makes these, I don't know what to call them, but, but, you know, helps fake either news or fake people or fake ideas or f- a falsely rewritten history uh, become canon in that universe. And I think that's a uh, – that's something that Star Trek explores, but not in the way it's actually played out in our society. And I, I do find that interesting, uh, not necessarily as a deficiency of Star Trek, but as something that I'll say maybe Star Trek didn't anticipate and hasn't yet reckoned with. Absolutely. I mean, I suppose, although you do get, I guess, the, the, the big exception to that kind of version of events, and I think it is a, a notable exception, is the episode in the pale moonlight when you do have literally, uh, Cisco effectively and, and Garrick really doing the legwork, um, creating this, this, act of forgery this fake you know famously you've got that meme it's a fake uh, and of course it is discovered i suppose the other thing in star trek is it's u- usually this kind of fakery is discovered fairly quickly i mean even there are episodes where someone you know projects uh, uh pretends to be a you know they pretend their ship has the signature of a different you, you know a different race or whatever and the and they seem to have a way of like doing a sort of fake view screen and so on and projecting that but there's always this sense it's not going to last for very long they're going to be discovered quite quickly and usually in fact when there is a deception of one kind or another it is the technology that's kind of uh going to solve it i suppose there is a kind of we could say generally speaking there is more of an optimism maybe there's more of an optimism in, in star trek certainly you know going back to 90s star trek uh than there is in some ways i feel i'm sounding and you know what we are as i say in that literally the final day of a <laughs> particularly uh not the only recent particularly divisive and difficult election campaign and so on i think that kind of plays into it all but maybe we could say star trek is more um optimistic about kind of the truth coming out and the kind of um the safety of of some of these technologies one way or another but i feel we've been, we've I've, I've taken us down a very dark <laughs> gloomy mode and actually what i you know i wanted also to sort of celebrate a lot of these things that you touched on in your book and and to recognize really for me i mean I remember going back into the 90s reading um, Lawrence Krauss's book, The Physics of Star Trek, and sort of feeling how kind of out there a lot of these things seemed then. And admittedly, I think a lot of the kind of uh, big, you know, warp drive transporters and so on, we, we haven't still quite got to those things yet but we're kind of edging closer to some of them and a lot of these more practical things you know whether it's pads hypo sprays tricorders communicators with the flip phones 3d printers which are basically kind of replicators uh usb chips which are basically um you know isolinear chips and usb um discs are pretty much the same thing even you mentioned you know virtual reality augmented reality you've got the kind of google glasses all of these kind of things it does feel uh you know, like in an incredibly short amount of time, a lot of this has come to pass one way or another. I mean, were you surprised when you kind of looked into it doing the research for this book, just how many things, because some of these things I think we take for granted and we don't even think of. I mean, I don't know why I'd never really made the connection between a USB drive and an isolinear chip, but it is basically exactly the same thing. Um, All these elements in which the kind of ideas in Star Trek and whether it was directly Star Trek that inspired that particular uh, engineer or that particular design or whoever it was who made those decisions, but it does sort of feel like it's fed very much into the real world in a way that people who aren't Star Trek fans probably are completely oblivious to. And even those of us who are maybe uh, don't always appreciate it. You know, I think, I think it's really fascinating when I, when I approached this book, um, my first thought was not to think about what are the technologies in Star Trek that have made it in the real world. That didn't even cross my radar. What crossed my radar instead was let's take a look at what technologies Star Trek put out there that were either 
meant to be futuristic or were in their infancies but were not ubiquitous yet, what were those technologies that Star Trek and Star Trek The Next Generation sort of envisioned? And let's just real read them all off and take a good look at them and see how Star Trek envisioned them. And then from all of those different technologies, let's evaluate them. Let's evaluate them as far as scientifically, where are we today and like what, how far have we come as of, I believe I finished the book in 2017. So how far have we come as of 2017? And what I wound up with was I had a total of 28 technologies that I put into a bunch of different categories like communications or weapons or, uh, medical biological devices or, um, you know, or transportation, travel. Uh, so we put these into these categories. I wound up with a total of 28 technologies. And what I found was remarkable that only four of them of these 28 would require some kind of new physics that we don't know today in order to bring them to fruition. That 24 of them were either possible and on their way or already here, or in some cases, had already surpassed the vision that Star Trek laid out for them, especially on the computational and medical device front. Uh, many of the advances we've made were really, they go beyond the dreams of Star Trek at this point in time. And that to me was, was really fascinating. I remember I was in high school when Lawrence Krauss's uh, The Physics of Star Trek came out. And I remember reading that in high school and you know, 20 years later, uh, I'm the one writing a book on this, looking at many of these things that Krauss had said, like, ah, these will be impossible. This will never happen. And then 20 years later, here we are and there they are. Um, so I think it really speaks to how revolutionary science is. You know, one of the things that stuck with me from his original book was the idea of a transporter would just be ludicrously impossible because it requires some kind of Heisenberg compensator and such a thing is impossible. And just this year, uh, so this isn't in the book, but just this year, uh, they've leveraged something called squeezed quantum states where they can actually manipulate the Heisenberg uncertainty. You know, it says you can't know two specific quantities arbitrarily well simultaneously, um, like position and momentum or energy and time or your angular momentum in the X direction and your angular momentum in the Y direction. Um, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to decrease the inherent uncertainty in one of these quantities at the expense of increasing the uncertainty in the other. And that very idea, that was something that wasn't even on my radar in the mid-1990s when that book came out, and yet here we are. And not only is this now on my radar, but this is something that's implemented in some of the most advanced experiments, like the LIGO Gravitational Wave Observatory, um, that, that these are just in use now. And so I think about these technologies and not only how they're used in society, but how they're used to push the frontiers of science forward in ways that we couldn't have envisioned even 20 years ago if you were a top theoretical physicist. Absolutely. And I mean, a lot of the, the things that do seem kind of impossible. I mean, I suppose the transporter is one of the things that it feels like a kind of magical device almost. And, and we know that it was invented for Star Trek as a way of saving money on, you know, having shuttles taking off and landing every week. Um, and it, it is absolutely, I, I sort of sometimes think, you know, what of all these technologies, what's the thing that would change my life the most? I mean, you know, the transporter would just, it would make life a breeze, wouldn't it? You know, there'd be no more commuting. There'd be no more long haul flights, you know, all of these kind of things in our, in our sort of everyday lives it would it would make so much easier but then so many of star trek's technologies i mean you know the replicator i mean i mentioned you know we have okay we have 3d printers and so on but you know if you were able to replicate unlimited supplies of food and it, and if you had the kind of social uh, arrangements and the kind of political arrangements to make that food available you could kind of end hunger overnight almost you know what i mean there there are these kind of potentials for these technologies to uh to really change the world. But equally, you know, as I mentioned, something like the internet, I mean, the internet has absolutely changed the world in, in profound ways, you know, both good and bad, I suppose. Um, uh, and I guess 
Star Trek is very invested in the idea that future technologies will change the world in new ways. You know, warp drive will kind of um, make us reevaluate our, our place in the universe, these kind of things. But I guess there is, you know, maybe there is some kind of hope that with more of these technological breakthroughs one way or another, um, who knows what the kind of impact might be. Uh, and, and maybe there is grounds to be optimistic as well. Yeah, I think so. And I think when you talk about things like the internet that Star Trek failed to anticipate, I think that's that's very interesting as well, because in the original series, you had this massive, massive control room that they talked about and they brought up in the animated series and they brought up in the movies, uh, where this was like the central computer of the of the bridge. And then in Next Generation, where you can talk to the computer and the computer talks back to you, and it's just this enormous, enormous entity, it never really occurred to to them that there would be this decentralized entity where the entirety of human knowledge would exist, that you don't have to actually, you know, carry a physical copy of the internet with you wherever you go, that you can just link to it, access it, and give it the piece of information you want to procure, like you can issue your uh, get command and the internet will give you its put command and give you the information that you wanted. Um, that's something that I think would have been a remarkable advance that Star Trek did not anticipate. And, and I think that that's, that's fascinating to remember too, that even as we try and anticipate what the future technologies that will transform our world will be, um, that's not something that's ever going to be entirely predictable. I think the successes that Star Trek has had on that front are all the more remarkable because of the ways we are unable to know what technologies will arise, when they'll arise, and how they'll be able to be done. On the other hand, you have technologies like a phaser, which I know the United States military has built a prototype of, which I think if that ever becomes ubiquitous, it could revolutionize uh, a whole slew of things, including and maybe especially law enforcement, that the ability to disable but not harm a target from a large distance away with extraordinary precision like that, that holds so much potential to save lives, to reduce police brutality, to um, to reduce crime in a way that I don't think any of the other technologies we have today – um, or are working on developing today could have foreseen. So sometimes I think you need the advanced vision like Star Trek gives us. And sometimes you don't know what that final product is going to look like because you cannot predict how technology is going to develop and unfold. And often there is an element of inspiration, I suppose. And as much as, you, you know, Star Trek has proved an inspiration to real world uh, designers, uh, innovators and so on. I mean, Captain Picard had that great line, things are only impossible until they're not. And I suppose there is that kind of sense of, you know, in order to create something new, you have to be able to imagine it first. Yeah, that's true. And a lot of the things that we think are impossible, either because they're impractical or because they violate the laws of physics as we know them, um, oftentimes there are new applications of existing laws in addition to the possibility of discovering new laws where suddenly a technology that was impossible falls within the realm of possibility. And I think something like the, uh, like the transporter or warp drive, that's the category that those technologies for, uh, which are two of the four that that are currently impossible with existing technology, um, those are ones that could all of a sudden become possible if we either found some new type of physics or some new implementation of existing physics that we're unaware of today. And that that's something I find fascinating and gives me extreme hope that many of the problems facing our society today, facing our world today, are things that advances in new technology, particularly if we focus on advancing technology in an ethical fashion, can be used to improve our world in the future. Well, Ethan, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you about the technology of the future and the future of technology. Um, before we go, do you want to let our listeners know um, where they can get a hold of a copy of your book? And uh, if they want to contact you on social media, and maybe continue the conversation there. Where's the best place to find you? Sure. So I am Starts With a Bang on Twitter, on Facebook, and on my blog on Forbes. And 
My book, Trechnology, The Science of Star Trek from Tricorders to Warp Drive, is available uh, wherever books are sold, including on Amazon all around the world. And uh, if you're interested in continuing this conversation, I encourage you to follow me on Twitter and reach out. Well, it's been fun talking about technology, but that's not the only thing we've been doing on Trek FM this week. So here's a listen to what else you might have missed out on on the network. Previously on Trek.fm, The Ready Room. Did I ever tell you the story about how Channel Channel 4 in Oklahoma City played Next Generation at 10.30 because that's when they had played yeah. the original series reruns the last time they had a shot at it? Yeah. And you think that's insane, but their thinking was, are you kidding? Do you know what kind of ratings we get with Star Trek at 10.30 on Sunday night after the local news? We'd never get those kind of ratings with anything else. And I'm like, but you would get even bigger ratings if you put it at a normal time. <laughs> and so they finally, going into fourth season, they had a big cl- like, okay, fine, fine, fine. But best of both worlds, part two of <laughs> all the times to change the airtime and then not tell. They didn't promote it. <laughs> to the journey. Another interesting statistic on this while we're talking about it is that past a certain point in human history, I forget the exact number, but I I read an article on it, but past a certain point, anyone who is alive at that point is statistically likely to be an ancestor of everyone alive today. Well, that just sort of broke my brain. Can you... (laughs) I know. It's weird to think about that. <laughs> if you go far back in time enough in human history, at a certain, it's like a crossover point yeah, almost, where yeah. anyone alive at that point, at prior to that point, is likely to be an ancestor of every living human today. Gosh. That's an amazing stat. Statistically. Yeah. That's yeah. an amazing stat. The Edge, a Star Trek Discovery podcast. You're not going to get in Discovery, or at least I hope they don't, things like references to Grand Vegas Rom. That, that's nothing in comparison, do you know? Like, oh, I, I can do you one better. Grand Vegas Brunt. Oh, Brunt. <laughs> C-A. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Combs, I love uh, you. <laughs> can we please have Jeffrey Combs in Discovery? Earl Grey. How are we bettering ourselves and the way that it seems to be is through high culture. Well, I think it also ties into this kind of utopianism of Next Gen. I mean, Next Gen is the most, I mean, people say Star Trek is utopian and I would broadly agree with that, but Next Gen is absolutely the most utopian. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favourite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad or Apple TV or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And please leave us a star rating and a written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Primitive Culture, and that will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at TrekFM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash TrekFM. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash TrekFM, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash TrekFM to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits and more, available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host and distribute these shows each month, so we really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you can find all our details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd like to take a moment now to thank our associate producers on Primitive Culture, Amy Nelson, Clara Cook and Tony Black. Amy is a presenter of many other shows on the network, and you can find her on Twitter at at Miss Amy Nelson. Clara and Tony were two of the former co-hosts of this show, and they'll be popping back from time to time. You can find Clara on Twitter at at Clara Jean MC and Tony at at AJ Black Writer.
You're blended already.